Good morning. Everything that Jesus ever does in the Gospels is intentional. Think about that for a second. He lived a completely intentional life. He never did anything which was haphazard or by accident, indeed, or in his words. He never spoke anything by accident. Every single word that Jesus Christ ever spoke was on purpose and was the truth of God. And everything that Jesus ever did, he did with a reason and a purpose. It was all intentional. He never made a mistake in anything. And understanding the truth of that helps us to comprehend some seemingly strange things that we see him do. They're strange to us, but they're not actually strange. He has a reason for doing them. I mean, things like going directly from the grain field where he was just accosted by the Pharisees for breaking the Sabbath, where with their intention in accusing him was to kill him because breaking the Sabbath deserved death. He goes directly from that grain field and walks into their synagogue. If that was me and they were accusing me of doing that, I would walk away from their synagogue, from their home base, and get away from those people. But Jesus goes directly there. Why does he do that? He goes there intentionally for this reason. Because the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we can learn so many life-changing truths from Jesus' decision to go to that synagogue on that particular Sabbath day 2,000 years ago. And so let's ask the Lord to open our hearts and our minds as we study his word today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that everything you do is intentional and with the purpose of glorifying the Father and glorifying yourself and by doing what you do, you have brought salvation to the world and even to us on the other side of the world because you commanded your servants to go and preach the gospel and they obeyed. We're so thankful for that. And so, Lord, I want to preach the gospel now today. Please use this broken instrument to speak the truth about you. Open up our ears and our hearts and our minds. Clear out any distractions from our minds that we would hear your word and believe it, that it would speak to us from the pages of the Bible today. Thank you so much for your amazing grace. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who illuminates our minds. Be with us now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Passages, Matthew 12, 9 to 14. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Look at verse 9 again. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. When the text says that he went on from there, it's referring obviously to the previous eight verses where he was in the cornfield or the grain field and they were accosted by the Pharisees. Uh, so this is probably actually the same day. He goes from the cornfield into the synagogue. And when they were in the field, they were falsely accused of breaking the Sabbath because the disciples had decided to stop and have a bite to eat. They were hungry. And so after Jesus schooled the Pharisees on the law and on their own legalism, it says that he went on from the field and entered their synagogue. Now, ostensibly, Matthew is referring to the synagogue of these same Pharisees who had just attacked Jesus. And it's on the same day. So then, why does he go there? 
I mean, what's the purpose? Uh, we know in, in the general sense, it's to seek and to save the lost. That's the purpose of his whole life was to do that. But in a particular sense, it's because Luke 4.16 says that it was Jesus' custom to attend synagogue on the Sabbath. It's his custom. That means he does it all the time. That's what he was regularly doing. When he first started his ministry, he was there. He took the scroll of Isaiah. He read a few verses from Isaiah, but it says that he was there as was his custom. And so what that means is that before Jesus even began his ministry, his public ministry, he had been going to the synagogue every Saturday for his entire life. That's his custom. That's what he does. He attends the synagogue. He wasn't about to let these men prevent him from going to a worship service, all right? I know sometimes in the church world there might be people that you feel like, oh, I don't want to see that person. I don't want to go to church today. They said something mean or they smelled bad when I sat next to them last week. Or Nothing was going to stop Jesus. Nothing should stop you from coming here. Just sit in a different seat or endure it. The main focus of Christ's life was obedience to his Father. And not even the devil himself could stop Jesus from going to a worship service. That's the first reason. And secondly, as I said, everything Jesus ever does is intentional. There's a reason that he chose that particular synagogue that day. It was to show who he is by rescuing a poor man out of his miserable condition. Look at verse 10. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? As Jesus enters the synagogue, Matthew draws our attention to a man that was there with a withered hand. It was probably a congenital condition, something that he was born with, where maybe only one finger came out and the rest was, you know, kind of just like this. Just maybe wither. It was just a withered hand. Have you ever seen anyone like that? I remember um, I used to go to a, a restaurant, and there was a, a young girl who was a server in the restaurant, and she had a withered hand. And for her, it, it, it was, I mean, I, I loved the restaurant. I would go there all the time. And I would see her all the time. And it was something that, she, for some reason, she, she wanted to hide. She would always go like this and put her hand inside of her sleeve so that people wouldn't see it. But, of course, you know, she has to take orders and, and write things down. And she had one finger and one thumb, and she was able to write with it. But then she would always hide it. And for this girl, she was embarrassed by it. She was embarrassed by it. We're going to see some of the cultural things that were going on at this time, too, that I think probably would have been very similar to that. It was a source of um, maybe even shame or embarrassment for a person who had that kind of a condition. This deformity that the man had was actually very sad. It was more than just an inability to use his hand. For instance, Levitical priests were not allowed to serve in the temple if they had a deformity like that. In, uh, in Leviticus, it says that if they have a hand that's crippled, they can't go in. If they have a foot that's crippled, they can't go in and serve bread in the temple. They couldn't do that because of the holiness of God. And this, this uh, deformity was sort of an outward manifestation of the fall. It was a visual representation of the fall of man. And you have some kind of vis uh, visible outward deformity, that we're broken. And so they weren't allowed to serve. It wasn't that God didn't love those people. Of course he loves them just the same. It's just that in that kind of service they couldn't go in to the temple. And that extended even to others, not just the priests, but in Acts chapter 3 we see the lame man who is a beggar. He's not able to walk. Where do they lay him? They don't bring him into the temple. They lay him at the gate of the temple. He's not able to go in, you see. He's lame. His feet don't work. So there's this sort of religious exclusion that the man suffered. But on top of that, there's also a social exclusion as well. The predominant mindset of the first century Israelite was that if you have some deformity, it's most likely because you're cursed by God. Because you've done something wrong. You remember John chapter 9 when the disciples, uh, these aren't Pharisees, these are the disciples of Jesus. They see a man who was born blind in John chapter 9 and they say to him, they say to Jesus, Master, what about this man? Who sinned 
him or his parents that he was born blind. You see, they already made this assumption that someone had to have sinned in order for that condition to have happened to him. Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. This happens that the glory of God would be revealed in his life. See, in, the, in, that instance, in that instance, in John 9, the disciples were acting more like Hindus, okay? They almost believed in some kind of karma, you know? This man must have done something wrong for this to happen. We don't only see it in the disciples, though. We also see it in Job's miserable comforters. Bildad the Shuhite. Hey, you know who the shortest man in the Bible is? Bildad the Shuhite. <laughs> I'm dumb, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know who the second shortest man in the Bible is? Nehemiah. All right, all right. Forget about all that ridiculousness. In Job chapter 8, Bildad the Shuhite, he says this as he's, you know, trying to comfort Job. He says this, can papyrus grow where there is no marsh? Can reeds flourish where there is no water? Yet, while yet in flower and not cut down, they wither before any other plant. Such are the paths of all who forget God. The hope of the godless shall perish. You see, what he's saying is that, that uh, these reeds can't flourish, the papyrus can't flourish, it withers, it withers, and such are the paths of all who forget God, the hope. Hope of the godless shall perish. So what Bildad is basically saying to Job is, the reason that you've lost your sons, the reason that you've lost your house, the reason that you have uh, all these sores all over your body is because obviously you've forgotten God, Job. It obviously has to be the reason why, because, you know, why else would you be afflicted? Why else would you have these terrible things happen to you? It must be your fault. And Job keeps saying, no, I didn't do that. The Lord is the one who says to Satan in the beginning of the book of Job, there's no one like Job on all the earth. He's my faithful servant. Job loves God. He loves God. That did not happen to Job because of some sin that he did. And yet there was this mindset. There's this mindset that prevailed. You have some kind of deformity. We saw it in John 9. It must have been something that you did. We see it in Job's friends. But you know, in Job 42, God rebukes Job's friends, and he says that they have not spoken rightly about God. So if you ever, listen now, if you ever hear someone say that some kind of a physical thing, some kind of a but some terrible congenital defect or something like that is caused because, well, this person must have sinned or done something wrong. You need to say, stop being like Job's miserable comforters. Stop being like them. It's not true. God has his reasons, okay? We're going to see some of that in just a little bit. Why? But, you know, this attitude remains to this day in the Middle East. It remains to this day. I was just watching... It was like an infomercial. I think it was for Doctors Without Borders. And they were uh, healing cleft palates of kids that were born. I think they were like born in Jordan, you know. They don't have access to medical care. And these doctors are going there. And they were saying in the infomercial that these poor kids don't have any friends. Because all their friends to this day, right now, the mindset still exists right now, that to this day, they, they're cursed. They think, ah, I don't want to be around that person. I might catch something from them. I might catch their, their bad curse that they have because they were born in such a way. Still exists to this day. So how should the Pharisees, the shepherds and teachers of Israel, have treated this poor man? They should have loved their neighbor as themselves. That's what they should have done. They should have taken care of him. They should have shown him compassion. But look at what it says in verse 10. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked Jesus, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. See, they decided to use this poor crippled man for their own wicked ends. They asked Jesus if it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they could accuse Jesus. How manipulative. They had no concern whatsoever for the man. 
He was just a means to their unjust end of accusing the Son of God of wrongdoing. Think about this guy. He's there. He's just going to church, okay? He's going, he's going to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And all of a sudden, he's brought into this huge, like, Pharisees. The Pharisees are, are ye probably yelling and attacking Jesus inside. And they drag this man. Hey, what about him? Hey, is it all right to heal him? What do you say, Jesus? This guy's like dragged into this situation. He did not go to, listen now, he did not go to the synagogue that day to be dragged into that. That's for sure. That's for sure. He had no idea that that was going to happen. Consider for a moment what these connivers were actually asking Jesus. They were not asking if it was lawful to Jesus, for Jesus to do surgery. They know that Jesus isn't a neurosurgeon, right? They know that. So when they say this question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? What they're actually asking is, is it lawful, Jesus, for you to do a miracle? All right, think about it. By their very question, they acknowledge that Jesus is able to do something that no one outside of God's power would be able to do. They're asking him, is it lawful to do a miracle, knowing, acknowledging by their question that Jesus is able to do a miracle. Incredible. In Mark chapter 3, it says that in the same, it's the same story in Mark 3, it says Jesus looked at them in anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Of course, this story really makes me angry. As I was reading it, I kept hitting my desk. St like, stop it. Stop doing that. Stop acting that way. Do you know, that's, I think that that's, in part at least, Matthew's purpose in writing it. We should feel that way. Stop it. Don't tell me that unbelievers are rational free thinkers. Okay. No, no, this is willful and irrational and cruel to a poor crippled man who was at the synagogue to worship God. So then how does Jesus answer them? Look at 11 to 12. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Like, duh, of... of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You see, Jesus had already addressed their question before. He addressed their question before they asked it in verse 7. If you would have known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have held the guiltless uh, guilty, or, or you, you would not have condemned the guiltless. And here he goes further and he gives an example. See, he could have said, listen now, if your son or daughter falls into a pit on the Sabbath, are you going to stoop down and help them? He could have said that, but he didn't. In order to just make the, the strongest point and expose their utter hypocrisy, he uses a lowly, dumb animal. If you have a dumb animal, just a sheep, and the sheep falls down in a pit, are you going to say, oh, well, it is the Sabbath, and not try to help the sheep? See, his, it's called using rhetoric, all right? He's asking a rhetorical question here. The answer is, of course, yes, they're going to go down and help the sheep. Oh, but it could be work. No, it's good to do what's good on the Sabbath. That's what's right to do, all right? The sheep is down there in a pit. You're going to stoop down and help him out. And then how much more valuable is this man? See, they were willing to help a sheep. They are totally unwilling to help this man made in the image of God. Jesus is, in essence, telling these men that if they think rest on the Sabbath means don't help people, then they've lost their minds. See, God desires that we do good, that we show love and mercy. He's reiterating again what he said in verse 7. God desires mercy and not sacrifice. See, because we naturally, in our natural selves, we desire sacrifice and not mercy. We desire to do sacrifice and not mercy because we want to justify ourselves. We want to be able to say, but look what I've done, and what I've done makes me right with God. We want to be able to say that, but we can't say it because nothing that we do, nothing that we could ever do could make us right with God. You see, oh, I have much more. I mean, even in this case, uh, in terms of mercy, isn't it easier to just sacrifice than show mercy? 
Isn't that easier? I would much rather give more money to the church. I'd much rather go and volunteer my time and go paint somebody's house than call up someone who's hurt me and said, I forgive you and show mercy to them. It's much easier just to sacrifice, isn't it? Am I, am I alone there? It's much easier to avoid showing mercy. Let them stew in it for a while, right? I'm not going to show mercy to someone who's hurt me. I'm just going to, you know, I'll atone for it in some other way. Lord, you know, I had this terrible argument with someone, with a friend the other day, and I don't really want to show them. They were in the wrong, and I'm holding it against them. I'm not going to show them mercy. I'm just going to, uh, you know, I'll volunteer for a one of a couple more days. The Lord says, I desire mercy. That's the problem with these people. They had never received mercy. They had never understood the mercy of God. And so they were not about to show mercy to others. You see their heart here, their wretchedness here, in dragging this poor man in front of Jesus to try to trap Jesus. They wanted, they think about it. So it's like the, you could see the devil in this. If Jesus says, yes, it's lawful for me to heal him on the Sabbath, they're going to see, ha, you're a Sabbath, there is, you're a Sabbath breaker. Yep, you break the Sabbath, you're doing work. Healing is work, you're doing work. You're a Sabbath breaker, you deserve to die. If he says, no, they're still going to try to get him some other way, and here's this poor man still left there in his miserable condition, especially for that time, totally miserable and wretched, totally excluded from social and religious life. Man, what they did was so wicked, so evil. Look at what David says about how God views these things about how God views what a true sacrifice should look like. In Psalm 51, verse 16, David says this, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Here it is. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. You see, what David was saying there was this, that before you have a broken heart over your sin, before... Before you repent and trust in the Lord Jesus, all your sacrifices mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. God despises those kinds of sacrifices. The sacrifice that God accepts is a broken heart. Seeing your sin, crying out to God for mercy. That's the kind of sacrifice. The sacrifice of a broken heart. Sacrifice your heart on the altar. Break your heart. Give it to God. And then after that, the Lord brings healing, and then you can sacrifice. Then you can give to God, because it doesn't flow out of some sense of, I need to do something to make me right with God, and if I do A, B, C, D, then I'll be right with God. It never flows out of that, because I know my heart is broken. I'm a wicked sinner. I deserve hell and death. Nothing but hell and death. Absolutely nothing. And he rescues me. Now you know what I want to do? I want to give him everything. I want to die for Christ because Christ died for me. That's it in a nutshell, isn't it, what David said? In the next verse, we're going to see why God desires mercy on the part of his creatures because he himself is merciful. Look at verse 13. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored, healthy like the other. Notice, Jesus didn't massage the man's hand. All right? He didn't say, oh, let me see here. Hmm. And he's, you know, stretching out each finger and giving it a massage and doing all this work like that. He didn't do that. He did not spit on the ground and make mud and put it on the man's hand like he does to the man's eyes in John chapter 9. He did not take out a scalpel and say... All right, this is going to hurt a little bit. Come here. He did not do that either. What did he do? He said four words. 
Stretch out your hand. Say it together with me. Stretch out your hand. That's all Jesus said. He said, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. The point of this passage is that mercy and grace is given to this man by the Lord. Jesus doesn't ask the man to bring a sacrifice. He doesn't require the man to do anything but to stretch out his hand, and in obedience, the man does. You know, honestly, I don't think that that was an easy thing for the man to do. I don't think that that was easy for him to do that. I think that this was a source of shame for him. I think he was like that poor girl that was in the restaurant that I used to know, that I used to go to when I used to live in Palatine. It was probably something that he had kept hidden in his sleeve, most likely. To expose the thing that people look down on him for in front of an entire synagogue full of attendees. If he was born with that condition, maybe the other kids made fun of him for it when he was a child. And here Jesus asked him to expose, expose his withered, crippled hand in front of everybody. But when he brought that source of shame to Jesus, he was healed completely. When I was a child, my mother used to love to read books to me. She would read books like Robinson Crusoe, and Treasure Island, and Huckleberry Finn, and lots of other old classics. One of the books that she read to me was a book called Johnny Tremaine. Did you guys ever, has anyone here ever read Johnny Tremaine? Okay, shows you how old I am, all right? And uh, it was a story about a boy during the American Revolution who worked as an apprentice silversmith, and who had an accident where molten silver spilled on his hand and destroyed it when he was 12 years old. And one of the main storylines of the book is uh, how he dealt with the handicap. Well, eventually, in the story, a surgeon offered to do surgery on his wrecked hand to partially restore it so that he could go and hold a rifle and go fight in the Revolutionary War for the Americans. And Johnny had to debate whether or not to go through with the surgery because, of course, um, in the 18th century, undergoing hand surgery was not a fun thing, all right? They didn't have like things like, I don't know, morphine or uh, anesthesia. So he would have had to do surgery on a, probably a conscious boy. And, and anyway, it wouldn't be restored perfectly. All he could do is probably cut some of the silver that was still glued onto his hand like that, maybe cut that away. But listen now, that was a story that was written over 100 years ago, Johnny Tremaine. It's, it's, it's just a fictional story. But it proves this point, the surgery in the 18th century wasn't very good. But listen, we are now hundreds of years removed from that. We are 2,000 years removed and advanced from the time of Jesus. 2,000 years advanced. And our modern medicine cannot replicate what Christ does here with just four words. Even if uh, the best surgeon in the entire world today, the greatest, like, works at the Mayo Clinic, he's the best surgeon in the whole world, even if he does a complete hand transplant and puts another person's hand on top of the hand, do you know you think that hand's going to work the same as a natural hand? It's maybe barely going to be able to go like this. Maybe barely. If the surgery even goes well, if the person doesn't, if the body doesn't reject the new hand, It's maybe going to be able to grasp something someday with years of physical and occupational therapy. Maybe then, with a brand new hand and the best surgeon in the world in the year 2018, it would would barely work, barely. And Jesus Christ says, stretch out your hand. And it comes back. It's, It's suddenly, suddenly, The bones and the sinews and the skin and the fingernails and muscle and tendons and ligaments spring into existence that were not there just moments before. Hallelujah. Here's his, his hand is like this. And Jesus says, stretch it out. And he says, What's the man's reaction? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say what his reaction is. I don't know. If I'm that man, I'm probably going like this to Jesus. Going to clasp onto him with my brand new hand. Probably stared at it. Went like this, open and closed. Grasped his other hand. 
said, hallelujah, thank you, God. You know, I always say this because it's, it's so true how God in his amazing providence, like, we'll be reading a passage in the Bible reading for the day, which, you know, there's no way we could have planned it. And what did I read as I was reading the public reading of Scripture? Your hands have made and fashioned me. That's what the text says. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Why was the man in the synagogue that day? I don't know, probably that he would be given understanding and learn God's commandments. Pr probably, right? Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. I know, O oh Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Look at that. In faithfulness you have afflicted me. Look at what it says down here. Verse 81, my soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. I believe most likely that's the reason why that man was there that day, because he hoped in the word of God. That's why he was going to the synagogue. That's why he was attending it. He hoped in God's statutes. He needed to be rescued. And then God showed up. And God showed up right there. The God that he's going to the synagogue to worship comes in the front door. He walks in the door of the synagogue. And he's standing there. And the leaders of the synagogue are attacking him. How? By using the man. This man, ah, man, you know. <laughs> Bible's like, <laughs> Think about it. What they meant for evil. God meant for good. What they meant for evil, God meant for the salvation of this man, or at least, at the very least, to rescue this man out of that miserable state that he was in. They meant it for evil, and God flipped it on them. Jesus flipped it on them. Every move that Satan makes, God is ten steps ahead already. See, the devil is God's devil. He can't do anything that God doesn't already allow him to do. And he allows the devil to do some things which are against his will in order to use those things for his ultimate glory. I believe that Jesus went into that synagogue that day knowing that those wicked men were going to use that man and that he went into that synagogue knowing that so that he could use that situation to rescue that man. Incredible. Amazing. Just amazing. In the very place where the man should have found the most compassion from the leaders of Israel, they instead use him to attack the Lord Jesus. But God used it for good. The man went into that synagogue that day to worship God, and God came to him and restored him. And so I think the same thing could be said that Jesus says in John chapter 9. This happened. If this man was wondering why, why did I go through this for my whole life? This happened so that the glory of God might be revealed in his life. That's the reason why. Here we see the essence of Christianity. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, Christianity is God-seeking man. That's it. Christianity is God-seeking man, manifesting himself unto him, drawing himself unto him, and we see here the Son of God came down from heaven to seek and to save that which was lost. Oh, sinner, Christ calls you to stretch out your hand to him. To expose your shame to Jesus that he would heal you completely. He's willing to receive all who come to him. He even says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I believe that Jesus knew that this man would be there that day. Every one of that man's days was written down in Jesus' book before one of them came to be. I believe that's why he left the grain field and entered that particular synagogue. 
to show his beauty and his heart and to rescue this man from his condition. Now the reason the text doesn't say what the man's reaction was is because Matthew's emphasis here is what God is really like as opposed to the way God is portrayed by the Pharisees. And of course, this makes the Pharisees even more mad. The truth was divisive to them. They did not like what Jesus was saying and what he was doing, and it didn't matter that he did miraculous things in front of their eyes. Look at what it says in verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Behold, once again, the irrationality of unbelief. Seeing is not necessarily believing. Think about it. These men just saw a crippled man that they've known for a long time. Oh, how do you know they've known him for a long time? Well, it says that this was their synagogue. All right? This is the guy who's in their synagogue. I mean, I know most of you here sitting here. All right? I would know you by face. I would, I would know you if you had some condition like this man. I would have seen that probably by now. Okay? They know who this man is. They've seen him in the synagogue before. This is their synagogue. He walks in again like this, like he always does with his crippled hand. And then they saw a new hand grow in a split second right in front of their eyes. And look, it. you know, here's actually, here's the most amazing thing about this. Does Jesus actually do any work? Just think, think about that just for one second. They're trying to get him to do some work, right? He doesn't even do any work. He just says, hey, stretch your hand out. Like, okay. There you go. <laughs> they hated him without a cause. They hated him without a reason. Actually, we're going to see a couple of the reasons why they hated him in just a second, okay? Okay. They were eyewitnesses of a stupendous miracle. But were they contrite? Did they beg forgiveness from the Lord of the Sabbath? Did they fall on their faces and cry, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. No. 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 Instead, what they did is they went out and they plotted how to destroy Jesus' life. Why? Why did they do that? First, because they were embarrassed by him. Because they're embarrassed by him. They think they're so smart. They have PhDs. They have PhDs even in the Bible. This is in front of all of their whole congregation. They're going to trap Jesus. He's going to be exposed. Do they think he's going to be exposed? And instead, he completely embarrasses them and shows their heart for what their heart really is. Shows how they were just using that man. The man was ashamed of his condition, but now they are shamed in front of the people for their mercilessness. And Christ calls them out for being merciless. Second, look at verse 15. The next verse that we'll hopefully cover next week. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Oh, snap. And many followed him, and he healed them all. So what does that mean? That means that Jesus just took away their whole congregation. All right? They had their whole church right there, and they, the congregation sees what kind of men these are. Jesus exposes them. They see what kind of men that, that They've been following merciless men, wicked men, men who are trying to attack the Lord, and then the Lord does the most amazing, miraculous thing, which beyond a doubt proves that no one but God could do what this man does, this Jesus. And so what do they do? They leave the Pharisees and they follow Jesus. Yeah, of course. And when two people are still left in their church, in their congregation, they're like, we're going to kill this guy. took away their source of uh, tithes, their upkeep, their upkeep, their salary. They're not going to follow those men anymore. They want to follow Christ. They want to follow Jesus. Oh, they want to kill Jesus now. They want to get rid of Jesus. Yeah. Third reason. Because what Jesus says 
continuously undermines their entire corrupt man-made system. He undermines their man-made system of self-justification, of making themselves right with God by what they do. And Jesus says, no, 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 it's not like that. That is not the way to be right with God. Friends, we shouldn't make the same mistake. Don't make the same mistake that these men did. When we see who Christ is and what he tells us the gospel is by faith in him, we can just come to him. He's done all the work. He's the one who says it is finished on the cross. There's nothing left for me to do. I must just cast myself upon Christ and continue to cast myself upon Christ. I mean, repentance is indeed in one sense a one-time thing in that when we repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are justified. But in another sense, repentance is a lifelong thing. I continually come to the throne of grace and say, Lord, once again, once again I've fallen. And I know that I'm your child and I know that you love me and I know that you saved me and I just want to be reconciled and have a relationship with you again. I've fallen away again and I need your forgiveness, Lord. I know you provided. I have faith in you. I have faith in you, Lord. I come to Christ every day. I repent every day. I say sorry every day. Not to gain some new salvation because I've lost it somehow. But because I, that relationship now means more to me than anything. And I want to follow him and I want to serve him. And I think it's possible in the Christian life, I mean, as, as actual justified Christians, for us to forget the gospel again. I've told you this many times, but I, I'll just keep telling you this. Luther said, I have, to preach my, I have to preach the gospel to my congregation every single day and every single week because they constantly forget it. And I have to preach the gospel to myself every day and every week because I constantly forget it. Because my natural disposition as a fallen person is actually the opposite of the good news of the gospel. I actually try to fall back, right back into auto-soterism, to self-salvation, self-justification all the time. Pride all the time. I pride, I'm wrestling with it. That's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 7. I do what I don't want to do, and what I don't want to do, that's what I do. Wretched man that I am, who shall rescue me from this body of death? Oh, but thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we wrestle with this. We wrestle with it our entire life as long as I'm in this wretched body. Until I receive a brand new resurrected body, I will have to wrestle with my sinful notions inside of me, with my rebellious heart. The Lord has made a new creation inside of me, but I still wrestle with the old man. I wrestle with him. Do you understand what I'm talking about, Christian? Do you wrestle with that as well? Once again, hear the words of Jesus. Stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand. That means stretch out your hand to him. If you stretch out your hand to Jesus, he will heal you. If you take your shame, take your sin, take the things that you're ashamed of, bring them to Jesus and he will heal you. You know, I'm not trying to allegorize the passage. This happened literally as the text says, but there's an application for us. He tells us to come to him. He tells us to stretch us out, to stretch out our hand, to reach out to him. Reach out to him. Oh, stretch out your hand. Right now, stretch out your hand. Reach out to Jesus. Reach out to him. And he'll heal you. He'll forgive you. He'll draw you to himself. He'll continuously make you new, sanctify you, make you more and more like him, give you a new life. If there's anyone here who's uh, never stretched out their hand to Jesus, then let today be the day. 
Because the reality is, we have withered souls that need to be stretched out and restored. The Lord wants to do that. That's his heart's desire. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Lord, thank you so much for seeking this man out. You came to him. He was in the church, and you came there, and you spoke to him directly. You spoke to the man. Lord, I pray that you would speak directly through your word to every single person here. Tell us to stretch out our hand, to bring that withered thing to you, that we might be restored. Thank you so much for your amazing grace. Thank you for showing us the way of the Pharisees was wrong. It's a way that at one time, truly in some way all of us lived. We lived with this notion that if we're nice enough, if we're good enough, we could earn our way to you. We could earn your satisfaction. Lord, you've shown us the error of that. Help us to come to you now, Lord. We cannot do it on our own. We need you to draw us. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them. So, Father, I pray that you draw each one now. Even the oldest saint who's been walking with you for the longest time, draw them to you today. Thank you so much for your amazing grace, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.